It's such a pleasure to be here with you all and an honor to welcome tonight's readers, Kate Durbin and Matt Longabuco. Before I turn it over to them, I just have a few reminders and updates. Tonight's moderator, Anna Cranenberg, is adding a link to the chat now with some helpful Zoom tips and best practices. Please note that we are recording tonight's event. You're welcome to have your camera on or off as you prefer, but just keep in mind that if you have your camera on, it's possible that your little tile will end up included in the archived video. I also wanna note it's possible to access the live transcript of tonight's event by clicking that little red live link in the top left corner and selecting view stream, which will open the transcript in another browser window. If you have any Zoom questions or run into any difficulties, please don't hesitate to reach out to anyone with staff after their name and we'll be glad to help. We are grateful to you for joining us in the ongoing effort to build and nurture safer spaces where we can listen and learn together. Anna is now adding to the chat a link to our statement of safer spaces. Whenever we gather, sharing our time, even if not our physical space, we remain committed to building with you all an environment that challenges and resists ongoing structures of hierarchy and harm. If this event were taking place in our usual venue, we would be gathered together now in St. Mark's Church in the Bowery, where we have hosted events for more than 50 years. St. Mark's Church was built over the site where Peter Stuyvesant constructed his family chapel in 1660. Stuyvesant enslaved 40 people and in his time as director general of New Netherland increased the population of enslaved Africans in the colony, whose stolen lives and labor were used to construct the buildings and streets on the stolen land. St. Mark's Church is located on the unceded homeland of the Lenape people, Lenape Hoking. I am speaking to you tonight from what is called Sunset Park in Brooklyn, which is the unceded homeland of the Canarsie, a Muncie-speaking band of Lenape people, a neighborhood whose waterfront was redlined in the 1930s, a waterfront that is now the site of Municipal Detention Center, a federal prison where 1,600 people are currently experiencing incarceration. As we gather across various neighborhoods and states, it gives me occasion to remember that it's not just some of the land that was stolen or some of the land that needs to be returned, but all of it, everywhere, from Lenape Ho King to occupied Palestine. It reminds me too that to return the land is not a matter of transferring capitalist ownership, but as many indigenous thinkers have taught us, a radical rethinking of ownership and belonging, centering indigenous autonomy and active relationality and responsibility. To reiterate Gloria Anzaldúa's assertion, this land was Lenape Hoking always and is and will be again. Anna is putting a link to a map in the chat now, not to endorse it as complete, but to invite you to join us in learning continually about the land we occupy, its history and ties as a path towards deeper accountability. Thank you for reflecting on this with me. It's now my honor to introduce Kate Durbin. Rereading Hoarders, I am reminded that the germ of accumulation is loss, that primary to the experience of days on earth is the dread of slipping away. Time, love, people, things passing endlessly beyond our grasp. In Hoarders, we meet a cast of people whose earnest attempts to resist decay and disintegration take the form of welcoming it in, opening their homes to the overgrowth of ages. It's like a kind of faith to look at an object and recognize that it's not trash, its beauty persists, its purpose is yet to be fulfilled, and moreover, its ultimate value is intrinsic beyond beauty or use. I hope that we are all saved so lovingly from the rubble. This book invites us to think about the relationship to the salvation projects of hoarding and the work of writing, both as creation and as documentation. We can start with a Barbie doll and contained within her incomprehensible frame, everything that made such a thing possible. And from the Barbie doll, we get to Shelley, a woman in Warren, Michigan, who has collected a fortune in dolls. And from Shelley to the television program Hoarders, recording Shelley's efforts and struggles. And then there is Kate Durbin, collecting a necessarily incomplete and fragmented inventory of speech and treasures. And then there is me, the reader, imagining these homes and their inhabitants, and then later visiting barbie.mattel.com and looking up each individual Barbie one by one, just to look at them, to know that they're real. Every syllable, every plastic filament, a whole world unfolding. I think a lot about shame reading hoarders and pride. Some characters express embarrassment, or many do, while others are glad to have done something exceptional, 
unforgettable. Durbin approaches her subjects with graceful non-judgment, an empathy that never slips into overwriting and erasing. She helps me imagine spaces beyond both shame and pride where valuation is replaced with her luminous generosity, where abundance isn't caught in the relentless trap of precarity, where salvation isn't contingent on the fear of mortality, where what grows over the rot can grow freely and free. Kate Durbin is a Los Angeles-based artist and writer whose books of poetry include Hoarders, E! Entertainment, and The Ravenous Audience. Her digital poetry app, Abra, won the Turn On Literature Prize for Electronic Literature in Europe. In 2017, and again in 2020, she was the Arts Queensland Poet in Residence. Kate's artwork has been shown nationally and internationally, and has been featured in the New York Times, Art in America, Art Forum, and elsewhere. I am so pleased to turn it over now to Kate Durbin. Thank you so much, Laura, for that beautiful introduction. Um, and I also wanna thank you for all of your careful work putting tonight's event together. Um, I'm so honored to read with Matt. And you know, one of my first readings ever in New York was at the Poetry Project. And um, I wore this kind of unicorn dress um, so it's like a decade ago. And I just remember it as being um, a very iconic and special night in the city. Um, so I wanted to begin tonight by reading an artist statement about my book, um, and then I'll read some poems from Hoarders. Thank you for all being here tonight. Before I read four poems from Hoarders, I'd like to share with you a little bit about why I created this book, what drew me to the material, and my experience writing through the reality TV show. My family's life has been shaped for decades by mental illness, substance use, and hoarding. On a personal level or a heart level, I was drawn to and also frightened of watching and writing about this show. I had never watched the show before I wrote about it, and I quickly realized once I started watching that I was right to feel hesitant as it was a very painful experience. And yet I also felt compelled to write and think through the complex relationship between people and objects to seek understandings of the relationships between individuals and their things. Those who hoard have a lot to say about their objects and the traumas they have been through in this difficult country where you're often on your own when you're in trouble. I believe their stories are important to listen to. We have such strong and sticky attachments to the objects in our lives. We experience them with as much emotion as we do our relationships to other people. In many ways, they are our companions and have stories of their own to tell. So I'm gonna start with the first poem in the book, Marlena. Each poem um, is titled after the name of the character and then the location uh, where they live. So this is Marlena, Topanga Canyon, California. I'm Marlena, the worst hoarder on planet, pink sands, Yankee candle. My house is like a bomb went off at Walmart, shattered seashell wreaths, tangle of rainbow LED hummingbird wind chimes, tie-dyed lion tapestry with a hole in the lion's face, Drew Barrymore flower home collection plates with half-eaten Luna bars and dead wasps. I was a fashion model for many years in Europe, moth-eaten Balenciaga dresses. Then my husband and I fell in love. Photo of young Marlena and a man hugging in front of a private jet, her hair in pigtails, her midriff tanned and toned. Our relationship was storybook. Ceramic plate of two chickens pecking, smeared with crystallized honey. After a few weeks, he proposed, some bleached hippie boho fabric lovebirds. I felt like we stepped onto a magic carpet and just flew. Cost plus world market decorative pillows, glitter elephant throw, crushed banana chips, blackened bananas, crumpled sunset magazine pages, stuffed panda and lotus pose on Marlena's bed. But after our daughter was born, my husband started dating other women secretly dozens of Louis Vuitton bags under the bed. When I found out, I just wanted a divorce. On the front door, keep out absolutely no solicitors, this means you. Beware of dog sign, card that says, 
Our Lady of Lourdes, pray for us, and underneath, in shaky handwriting, help me, God. I felt suicidal, but I had my two-year-old daughter to think of. Photo of Marlena's daughter in pigtails and big Chanel sunglasses playing the piano. That was a very hard time for me, completely lost in the bathroom, dusty makeup brushes, goopy concealer, murky bottles of Dior nail polish, melted cherries on snow Yankee candle with gray hairs stuck in the wax. I started collecting Whole Foods 365 products. My kitchen sink is totally full, organic Turkish apricots, cheddar bunnies, sea salt avocado oil, canyon cut potato chips, Himalayan pink salt popcorn, cookie dough collagen protein bars, organic goji berries, blue cashew, blue magic cashew milk, majestic sprouted hummus. My hoarding has caused a terrible rift between me and my American girl doll with a destroyed face. She started taking my things and throwing them out without asking. So I put all of her old things in plastic bags, Little Mermaid Ariel doll smeared with marker, Easy Bake Oven filled with old crumbs, Little Miss Makeup doll with red cheeks and lips and chewed fingers, clump of My Little Ponies. I said she wasn't welcome at the house anymore. Dirty lips pillow that says, kiss me. I want desperately to change. Marlena digging in neighborhood trash bins, a flashlight strapped to her head. She pulls out Chase credit card statements, styrofoam food containers, Starbucks reusable plastic cups. But I don't like when people throw out things that still work. Marlena testing a Sharpie on an electricity bill. When they put trash in the recycling bin, I move it to the trash. Marlena carefully moving a Chiquita banana peel from the recycling to the trash. When plants in the neighborhood are not properly watered, I do. Marlena facing a tree, pouring water on its roots, her slender legs and her thin neck, her gray hair. Even though this is trash to most humans on the planet, it isn't trash to me. Marlena slowly reaching into a giant pile of unopened Whole Foods items on her kitchen floor and lifting out a bottle of water. Marlena somehow pulling a clean cup from the eruption inside the sink. Marlena pouring herself a cup of water to drink. And then I'm gonna read Kathy. Laura, I wanted to mention, I'm so glad you know all the Barbies are real. I've had, had people ask me, those, all those Barbies can't possibly be real. Oh, they are so real, every Barbie. They're amazing. Um, I'm gonna read Kathy. So, and um, you kind of mentioned this, Laura, but each poem tends to center on one individual and one location the objects they hoard. And often those objects are centered around a specific type of object um, because I found that kind of going into one specific category of object really had a lot to evoke about a specific time and place and feeling. Um, so for example, there's someone in the book who um, hoards vintage Las Vegas casino items, um, someone else who hoards plants. Um, so that's kind of how each poem is uh, centered and constructed. This one is Kathy in Centralia, Illinois. I'm Kathy. I'm a medical lab technician, rhinestone tiara. I have five kids, four boys and crystal serving platter. I've worked night shift for like 21 years and I haven't been able to keep a house, sewing machine still inside the box. Most days, I don't see the sun, sequin lashes sleeping mask from Claire's accessories. I collect lots of things, but especially clothes, Windsor wildfire prom dress, $14.99 marked down from $149.50, Talbot striped flounce dress, $129 marked down from $169, Charlotte Roost lace and chiffon bridesmaid dress, $39.99 marked down from $49.99, my life is kind of dedicated to shopping. 
David's bridal halter wedding gown with a blusher veil. It's like an adventure, maze of Target lake lakeside collection pastel decorative pumpkins that spell out thanks. I like the color and I like the bling, pink rhinestone cupcake clutch. I'm constantly ordering off TV, sit and cycle. Every single day, it's almost like there's another package at the front door. Package ripped open with LuLaRoe winking Minnie Mouse leggings, LuLaRoe thorny rose leggings, LuLaRoe fire truck hydrant axe boot alarm leggings. I like the satisfaction of having something new. JTV heart-shaped pink topaz ring in a box that says, gift to myself. I've wasted a lot of money three identical Forever 21 beaded chiffon maxi dresses, 50,000 or more in credit card debt, David's bridal strapless corset wedding gown with a chapel veil. I have a sickness, pink medicine ball. For security reasons, I want to stay married, stair stepper. Do we really love each other? Probably not. Fairy tale bride Barbie and fairy tale groom Ken in separate boxes on a live, laugh, love shelf from Target. I don't want my children to have a broken home. Thomas Kincaid for Target puzzle of a painting of a snowy cottage, windows aglow with golden light. But technically, it's a broken home already. Paper plate that says, do not flush the toilet in Sharpie. There might be something in here that might still be important to me. Lexmark printer still in the box. I'm not sure what it is. Second Lexmark printer still in the box. My family thinks I'm selfish. Five Swarovski crystal encrusted Starbucks cups. You know what? I don't believe that. Keurig coffee pod carousel with hyper caffeinated vanilla blast, chocolate glazed donut, creme brulee, cinnamon roll, macadamia nut cookie. Bananas, Foster's Flambe, Italian chocolate cheesecake, peanut butter and jelly sandwich, cake boss, bada boom, mudslide, death by coffee, death wish pods. I really didn't ever like boys. Wayne Gretzky bobbleheads buried to their necks in lavender bath beads from Bed Bath and Beyond. I really didn't want another faded Space Jam bedsheet under a pile of brand new Wayfair butterfly pillowcases. And why throw away like a brand new old pink delicious Maybelline nail polish? Even though this has dust on it, I would like to shake this out and use David's bridal mermaid illusion wedding dress with a cathedral veil. I'm chronically disappointed. Plastic snowshoe that says, I believe in glitter cursive. I've never even liked Christmas. Filthy Olaf the snowman oven mitt. I am literally telling the truth. And then I'm gonna read Gary. Gary collects plants. Gary. So this is Gary in Franklin, Indiana. I'm Gary and I love plants, climbing roses covering the roof, shattered skylight with a ficus growing through it, buckets of rainwater at the foot of the stairs. When I see things grow, I feel like God, black mold slowly spreading across the ceiling. Because I've created vines and power cords wrapping around the banister. My house is like a greenhouse in the front hall weeping figs with no path through, shattered pots and dank earth underfoot, every room in the house filled with plants. I started collecting plants when I was forced to retire from my job as a paramedic. Gary standing in a bathtub packed with soil, clutching a dead yucca. When I got out, I missed the structure and I missed the people. In the living room, spider plants perch on chairs, leaves draping over arms. On the floor in tiny forests of philodendrons, ceramic satyrs, dancing mushrooms, laughing elves, frog drinking coffee, gnome with daisies in his beard. 
But some things I just like to forget. On each stair, succulents and 7-Eleven big gulp cups and worn men's New Balance sneakers. Some cacti with arms torn, others thin and shriveled. Lifting a skinny kid in a Cinderella nightgown who drank her parents' medication they used to help with their addictions. Dead orchid held to a stick with gauze, reflected in a glass gazing ball from Home Depot. Touching a dead boy's brain as I put his body in a bag after he flipped his new car. In the dining room, IVs drip water on raised beds filled with earth and cracked exposed bulbs. Taking an old man who couldn't breathe to the hospital and knowing his wife would never see him again. Dirt on the mattress in the shape of a human. This is your job. You should be tough. You should be able to manage. Kitchen table filled with cooking pots of water and ivy. Tiny gnats swimming in the shade of parlor palms. When my ex-wife moved my plants, I got so angry. Gary on a dirty mattress, a floral sheet pulled over him. Over the bed, a string of lights made to look like vines. Shelves of spider plants and mason jars, tendrils sweeping down, brushing his hair as he sleeps. I keep a hospital gurney. Gary pushing a gurney of cacti with upreaching arms through narrow paths between destroyed furniture and sickly yellow leaves that caress his ankles as he walks. I use it to move the plants from point A to point B. Gurney of cacti resting outside in the sun next to Gary on a chaise lounge. I know it doesn't make sense to other people, but it makes sense to me. Vines twine around mildewed armchairs and end tables. Grandfather clock face of the moon and stars. Walls soft with rot. Floors decomposing under dirt and maggots and dead leaves. On the mantle, also covered in vines and dirt. Old family photos and a small garden statue. And then I'm going to read one more poem. Um, this is Maggie from Ogden, Utah. I'm Maggie, and I'm a single mom. Blood red handprint on the outside wall of the house. On the inside of the house, we have furniture, we have clothes, we have toys, and we have demons. Mildewed nursery blankets her great aunt made with raggedy ants, one room schoolhouses, mirror image American flags, illegible old fashioned writing. This area is cursed, line of salt at the front door. There's something here, rooms on rooms filled with cardboard boxes, duct tape shut. The belief that it's cursed didn't come overnight. It took a long time to believe. Photo of Maggie as a teen in a Welcome to Las Vegas t-shirt. But I just saw thing after thing after thing go wrong that shouldn't. Swimming pool ladder leading to a brick wall. I believe the devil is after me. Photo of Maggie shielding her face from a camera flash. There's no way that so many different types of things and so many demons could come. Moving boxes filling every room in her house filled with objects or dust. There was a suicide demon here for three days. Everyone who set foot on the property during that time said they were going to kill themselves. Heel written in charcoal on the back of the house which faces a Rite Aid pharmacy. It took writing the name of God on the front door and the back door to get rid of it. On an interior plywood wall, resting on an exposed stud, is a sign that says, set thine house in order in black sharpie with a little hand-drawn house. The more darkness you allow in, the more darkness comes, tiny black hole in the kitchen floor. Demons are like the myth of vampires. They won't come in unless you invite them. Box that says, invoice enclosed. Between the hoarding, which was getting worse, and me being ill, those are just open doors opening onto doors, opening onto doors, opening onto rooms filled with boxes, duct tape shut. When you leave doors open, 
things come through. Maggie and her daughter watching TV on a couch surrounded by boxes on all sides. After about a year, I had a concussion and I was having strokes. It left me very debilitated. Children's playhouse wall thrown in the dirt, upside down rocking horse. So everything that I did, I did it to the extreme. If I was going to get wood out of the dumpster, I got every piece wood and metal siding tossed haphazardly in the backyard. If I was going to the thrift store to buy a self-help book, I bought every one they had, a pile of animal bones. After I got a concussion, no one came to help. No one was there. Care Bear with a dirty pink heart nose lying in the dirt. Friend just showed up one day, Maggie holding a cat skull in the palm of her hand. It has big eye sockets and sharp teeth. People have to talk to somebody. St. Joseph candle melted all the way down. I was completely alone and had been for some time. So I started talking to friend, blanket with Bengal tigers on it, blocking the window. I'd collect things for friend, fish bones, cow bones, deer, baby rats, things I think friend would like, blanket with Tigger and Pooh Bear. Inside the blanket are a wild turkey feather, stones, dirt, the hoarding got worse when I got stressed. When I was going through a marital separation, I got emotionally attached to some stuff and wouldn't let anybody throw away black funeral dress. When things are good, I save the vacuum cleaner dust, rows of jars and bottles with handwritten labels all filled with dust. When things are going bad, I have this good moment set in time that I can sprinkle around and it shifts the energy back to good mason jar filled with dust labeled Christmas 2004. This dust is me cleaning up my grandma's yard after she died. Ranch salad dressing bottle filled with dust labeled grandma's house 2008. This dust is me trying to remodel our house in 2014 when I was still trying. Rag liquid aminos bottle filled with dust labeled kitchen cupboards 2014. If we can't get this house cleaned up and get the demons out, we're going to be homeless. Maggie pouring her jars out on the front lawn, weeping. There's definitely war on earth between good and evil, dust billowing up from the ground, a shadow moving in the window. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um just so endlessly grateful for and moved by this book. And I really, anyone who hasn't yet picked up a copy, and maybe we could put the link in the chat one more time. Um, I just can't, I can't recommend it enough, truly. Thank you, Kate. And I'm now just so excited to introduce Matt Longabuco. This is such a dream reading. If there were a theme for tonight's reading, it would be more than the achievement of impeccable ekphrastic writing or to use Longabuco's name for it, covers, but instead the deeper questions that make covering and recovering necessary. How does meaning accumulate and around what, either luminous or cursed, does it cohere? The answers, of course, are fundamentally unstable because fundamentally relational, a betweenness, a haunted and atemporal interdependence. As Longabuco writes, where freedom is total, significance disappears. I am fascinated by the way Longabuco's new book, M.W., braids and unbraids narrative, fantasy, and materiality, or, you know, gender, through his far-reaching engagement with the 1973 film, The Mother and the Whore, and beyond this specific movie, movies, and beyond the movies, stories, and beyond stories, that confusing period between being born and dying. Longabuco reminds us that durational narrative art begins in lived experience and feeling and speaks back to the living with a precision that is sometimes easier to pretend isn't there. Quote, novels and movies tell us everything about life, only we forget to remember that about them and look toward life precisely the moment we should be shaking a novel emphatically in the air or ceasing all conversation to contemplate a movie in the dark, end quote. And like movies and living, this book is about time. It has questions about repeatability and change. Can you watch the same movie twice or are they too much like rivers? 
Watching now, Longabuco explains, this is a quote, I sometimes feel that former self inside me, the way a tree might chafe at some never healed deformation of its inner rings. Other times I know it would be as perverse to identify with that self as it would be for a creature to drag around the shed husk of its molted skin, end quote. Beyond all our personal deaths and rebirths framing our every action and interaction, we are also asked to locate ourselves in the post but never past frame of May 68, Occupy, last summer, last week, today. I love this book for its challenge to nostalgia, its refusal to expect answers for what to do now from what has come before without totally sacrificing the romanticism I need to live in this world. This is a book about men and doom, and at the same time, I am grateful for the depth of its sweetness, its tender insistence on the urgency of desire, its formal argument that if you look at the core of living and thinking, you'll find a bunch of ongoing conversations with friends, movies, your partner or partners, and everything else you give your heart to, keeping the ash out of your mouth, making you less terribly alone. Matt Longabuco is the author of several chapbooks, including Heroic Dose, his book, M W, an essay on Jean Eustache's La Maman et la Putain, was just published by Ugly Duckling Press. Poems and essays have appeared recently in Mirage, Lana Turner, and the Poetry Project newsletter. He teaches writing, innovative pedagogy, and critical theory at NYU and at Bard College's Institute for Writing and Thinking. I am so, so honored to turn it over now to Matt. Thank you so much, Laura. That was such a generous, um, wonderful reading of this book. And I'm so grateful that you asked me to be here tonight. Um, and it was just wonderful to hear Kate's uh, fascinating book um, as well. And hi, everyone. It's really great to see all your faces and names. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm going to read from the book, um, which I think explains itself uh, pretty well. Um, I'm going to start at the beginning and then jump around a little bit. Um, and I'm so grateful to UDP for um, making it and, and being so fabulous. Um, so yeah, I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of jump on in. Um, I, I just want to let people know that there's a, a one description of, of sexual violence in this passage and um, some talk about suicide also. A man wakes with a start grabs his watch. It's easily in reach. His bed is a mattress on the floor. Beside him, a woman sleeps face down under thick bedclothes, arms akimbo, her features not visible. The man rises, sprays something over his face from an aerosol can, a French thing, then finishes dressing in two silk scarves and a snug blazer. A last look at the sleeping woman and he's out the door. But he doesn't go far yet, just down the stairs to the next landing, in fact where a neighbor answers his knock. He asks if he can borrow her car and she promptly agrees, but reminds him the turn signal doesn't work. She offers her own solution. I never turn left. How much accommodation to what's broken, we might quickly wonder, is too much. Cars are like us, abundant and complex, entirely of their age, often beautiful, evident in their diminishments, unmistakable in their ultimate breakdowns. Turns out it's one of those Peugeots about the size and patina of a stylish bike helmet. Having parked along a boulevard, the man appears to be on some kind of genteel stakeout. He sits in the driver's seat wearing sunglasses with oval lenses, scowling over Le Monde. When he leaps out, it's to waylay a group of four students, three of whom walk on while he blocks the way of the fourth, a woman who seems irritated by his unexpected presence. I wanted to tell you, I've come to get you, he announces parrying her annoyance with his imagined version of how the meeting would unfold. It turns out they were lovers, now aren't. He urges her to consider all the precious time they've already lost. Tom perdu, he even says, we're having a Proustian encounter. After someone leaves you, after the tether of commitment snaps, there's nothing left but this abstract bloodless talk. And yet there's a duty to say it all, like washing the plates after a bacchanal. You should have said, I expected you, he instructs her as their conversation shifts to a park bench before they carry on to a cafe, only after she agrees to pay. You know, he tells her, I feel you in me so deeply, so near, I can't believe you feel nothing. What novel do you think you're in, she asks. Funny this familiar tactic to accuse the lover of living in a book or a movie 
as if those forms did not flower from the soil of feeling and experience. And isn't this a movie? John Eustache's La Mama et la Putain, the Mother and the Whore from 1973 is a bit hard to come by as Eustache's family has thus far prevented the DVD or streaming release of this or any of his films. I hadn't seen it in years. My girlfriend Rachel went home to Paris for two months and as a way to commune in her absence, we'd gone back and forth suggesting movies to watch together, hitting play simultaneously in our respective time zones. She'd heard Eustache's film mentioned before and was curious to see it. I told her I'd like to watch it again too, but how? It turned out she'd obtained a ripped MP4 from an acquaintance with a trove of obscure films at his disposal. At some level she knows or could guess that this acquaintance had once been a rival of mine in a bygone romantic entanglement, but probably didn't give a second thought to asking him. The severity of one's own drama drops off so precipitously in the estimation of others. It was all so long ago. And besides, she and I are far from love triangles these days unless we count as our third point, the almost singular figure the past becomes, or on the contrary, some unknown person who might walk out of the future, a possibility this movie is about to insinuate with a timing so arbitrary, it's indistinguishable from grace. Why won't the woman return to the man? Might as well ask, why does she hear him out all afternoon when she has by her own admission, another lover waiting and classes to attend? Desperate, perhaps wondering if she'll ever quite decisively cut the cord of his devotion, he tells her. The day I stop suffering, when I work it out, as you say, I'll have become someone else, and I don't want that. That day, we'll have lost each other forever. The novel he thinks he's in is A la Recherche du Tom Perdu. This woman even shares her name with Proust's narrator's first love, Gilbert. The man is Alexandre, played by Jean-Pierre Léod, who was 29 years old in 1973. He had already played many roles, including the character of Antoine Doinel, the filmic alter ego of director Francois Truffaut, in four films by the time he made The Mother and the Whore with Eustache. Truffaut had cast him in 1959's The 400 Blows based on a sense of affinity with his own troubled youth. Jean-Pierre, said Truffaut of his star, seeks to hurt, shock, and wants it to be known. Why? Because he's unruly while I was sly, because his excitability requires that things happen to him, and when they don't occur quickly enough, he provokes them. The director of Laod's school warned Truffaut that the boy was arrogant and defiant. Truffaut found, Truffaut found him brilliant and kind. The relationship was more than that of director and actor. Laod grew up a double. He revised, even as he played over decades, a version of Truffaut's past self. Laod is mesmerizing to watch, compact and energetic, a cockerel. His masculinity, like anyone's, is an interpretation, a variation on a theme. I wince at its shrillness. He never stifles his egoism and seems to only flash his vulnerability in order to periodically release the tension his overbearingness creates around him. But by this same token, he seems manifestly a little boy and the women around him tasked with letting him perpetually remain one. Alexandre tells Gilbert, He's ending their conversation. It has exhausted him. He even touches his temples, winces and struts away, his bell bottoms toll. Emoting, imagining and persuading our labor, like directing a movie. Leod played a director this same year in Bernardo Bertolucci's Last Tango in Paris. Truffaut-like, his hands raised in two L shapes to frame a perspective shot, he sets out to evoke on film the magical childhood of his lover, played by Maria Schneider. But we understand him to be pretentious, overly sensitive, cut off from the animal energy that animates Marlon Brando, to whom Schneider is erotically drawn, and whom she finally kills for the hopelessly tangled twofold reason of being appalled by his lower social class and frightened by his violence. Bertolucci's movie, along with Eustache's, marked a distinct aftershock of the new wave of French cinema, its exuberance now curdled to disillusionment, its hoped for new forms, social, aesthetic, collapsed into wreckage. The rot is not only described, it's enacted. To film Tango's most notorious scene in which Brando anally rapes Schneider, Bertolucci changed elements of the script, telling Brando to use butter as a lubricant without warning Schneider, denying her right to know what the scene would demand and violating both her person and her image. Schneider attributed her later drug use and attempted suicide to the trauma of her experiences with the film. The destruction depicted in these famously lifelike movies went beyond them into the lives they consumed.
Alexandre and a friend sit side by side at the Café du Mago, looking out onto the street. Alexandre always talks very fast and sits up very straight. He tells his friend, I read all afternoon. I plan to do it regularly, like a job. But a moment later, he's rushing off until caught in motion by the flagrant gaze of a woman at another table. He passes, turns back to catch her, ha catch her eye again. She's gone. He wheels around and she's marching off down the sidewalk, the fringe of her long black shawl swaying with each step. He jogs after her, says something. The scene fades. Now, Alexandre knocks on the door of the same friend he'd left earlier in the cafe. All this rushing around will be familiar to anyone who has experimented with indolence, which is like standing on a frying pan as it heats, and begs the question, is one's real wish to be forced to leap into the fire? I read all the articles on Eustache I can find online and experience a familiar writerly panic attack. Everything's already been said. Almost everyone calls the mother and the whore a masterpiece, the culmination of Eustache's concerns and a bleak vision of the aftermath of 68. Claire Denis and Olivier Assayas cite him as an inspiration. Jim Jarmusch kept a framed photo above his writing desk of Eustache on the set of this beautiful complicated film we're watching. I discover Pauline Kael's 1974 homage. It took three months of editing to make this film seem unedited. A eulogy for Eustache tells the story of a retrospective of his work held in Morocco. The writer, Serge Denis, imagines the heavy film canisters. There would be many for this long movie being painstakingly loaded and shipped to the event. Then Eustache, invited but not confirmed as a guest, surprises everyone by showing up and spends two days looking at the body of work he'd soon seal with his suicide. And I discover I've missed by a year a retrospective at New York's Metrograph, where I might have seen Le Cochon, the short film in which Eustache and his co-director Jean-Michel Barjol record in documentary fashion, The Slaughter of a Pig or 1974's Mi Petite Amoureuse, the follow-up to Le Mother and the Whore, an impressionistic record of the director's youth. And I won't catch in Sal Histoire, a pair of shorts from 1977, in which the same tale regarding the use of a peephole from a men's bathroom into a women's one is told twice, once as a monologue and again as a fiction. I'm heartened to know that Ustash was interested in repetitions, that he might have welcomed a book in which his movie is represented in which a voice both embalms and reanimates the object, the object and investigates the process of translation between forms, as slippery as the communication between those obscure galaxies we refer to for convenience's sake, if you'll forgive the Proustism as other people. More than a few of the critics who write about the mother and the whore struggle to reconcile the movie's power and allure with its seemingly reactionary politics and its dismal view of a world in which sexual liberation has led to emptiness rather than fulfillment, and political dreams have washed back ashore to decay in the shriveling glare of individual shortcomings and social deadlock. I'm holding on so far to the twists and turns in the story of these people who are ambivalent about each other, but also determined, as their maker claimed, to try to destroy each other. I'm ambivalent about them too. They can't figure out how to be together, and they fake or recall, but can't really find any lightness. I like lightness and worry it's more necessary than I sometimes think, but I can't often find it. Where does it disappear to? I'm aging, is that it? Or is everything about sex, the city, the future really so grim? I suspect I'll have to say eventually what a livable life might look like without this pretense to charm and romance French movies sold so well that it can be hard to imagine what our desire would look like stripped of their chic forever modern garments. I'll move like a movie to the next scene. It's an epic date. They meet at De Mago. How free, each asks, is the other, really? Alexandre defers. Veronica says she recently left someone. I cheated on him. I'm very demanding. I always expect too much, and I'm always let down. Alexandre describes a previous relationship in which he lived entirely at night, drinking, gambling, making love, and eventually lost track of the woman he was living with who led her life in the daytime. Bored at the chicken coop of the cafe, they, moved, they move on to a restaurant at the Gare du Nord, which Alexandre says he finds cheering because all the people around him are in transit. Like an F.W. Murnau film. F.W. Murnau films are always about transition from city to country, day to night. He asks again if he's boring her. She asks if she looks bored. No, but women are such liars. Yves Sedgwick on Proust. The narrator frequently describes his possession of Albertina as suffocatingly boring to him. And then there's the issue of her boredom, whether it's his fear, his delusional fantasy projection or his well-founded intuition. 
He tells Veronica about a Borges story in which a sect of heretics locates ecstasy and boredom in the void. He asks how her food is. Eating cold things, he muses, you taste the cold, but not the flavor. When you eat hot things, you taste the heat, not the flavor. When it's something hard, it's the hardness. When it's liquid, you feel the liquidity. So you have to eat lukewarm, soft things. She laughs her lovely laugh. What's a nurse's life like? Repetitive, she reports. Nights at home, she watches TV and showers down the hall while the news is on. He's surprised she doesn't watch the news. Things don't matter much to me, is her blunt explanation. When she goes out to a nightclub, she takes whoever approaches her. I can fuck anyone, but it doesn't last long. I turn a lot of people off. Alexandre considers this and answers wonderfully, that's normal. My neck and shoulders are soft, she says. I have pretty breasts and I don't like thin thighs on girls, do you? It's a detached appraisal as if from without. She might as well be calling herself a lukewarm soft thing. The French novelist Marie Dariussec writes of the painter Paula Motterson Becker, in Paula's work, there are real women. I want to say women who are naked at long last, stripped of the masculine gaze. Women who are not posing in front of a man, who are not seen through the lens of men's desire, frustration, possessiveness, domination, aggravation. Women in the work of Motterson Becker's are neither coquettish, Gervex, nor exotic, Gauguin, nor provocative, Manet, nor victims, Degas, nor distraught, Toulouse-Lautrec, nor fat, Renoir, nor colossal, Picasso, nor sculptural, Puvis de Chavannes, nor ethereal, Carolou Duran, nor made of pink and white almond paste, Cabanel, whom Zola made fun of. With Paula, there is no getting even at all, no sign of rhetoric or judgment. She shows what she sees. A past love on Instagram, the romantic scenarios she concocts, precisely how she changes with time, and then every so often an image that seems out of order, a flush of youth or a trick of light. Her distinctive voice is absent, of course. I recall it now only in dreams where her avatar remains convincing. And yet somehow the idea of her voice is there in the photos, in the smile or else the sternness behind her eyes. I'm afraid I once felt exactly like the villainous neighborhood mafioso, Michelle Solara in Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan novels. Solara's wife speaks with chilling clarity of the love her husband harbored for the narrator's brilliant friend, Lila. He didn't want her in order to have sex with her and then forget her. He wanted the subtlety of her mind with all its ideas. He wanted her imagination and he wanted her without ruining her to make her last. He wanted her not to screw her. That word applied to Lila disturbed him. He wanted to kiss and caress her. He wanted to be caressed, helped, guided, commanded. He wanted to see how she changed with the passage of time, how she aged. He wanted to talk with her and be helped to talk. You understand? He claims above all to have recognized her. Ferrante describes perfectly an obsession that must repel her to the core. Her heroes, Lila, Elena, and Nino are a kind of flipped over Veronica, Marie, and Alexandre. They too find their politics offer little protection against passions, degradations, and the license, flagrant, devastating, assumed by men. So a couple more passages. Proust's narrator, Marcel, like Alexandre, is a dandy and a know-it-all, and no one could be more cold-blooded, hoping his grandmother won't get sick because if she does, he'll miss seeing Gilbert in the park that day. He can't help idolizing old France, and he worships a past of aristocrats and their storied names, while the family maid is a source of comedy for her malapropisms and narrow judgments. But Marcel, the flawed character, is not the author of the novel, the one who sees those adventures and obsessions from a lofty height. Its atmosphere is parted to expose a seam and a path. That lie between our lover and ourselves, writes Proust in La Prisonnière, is one of the few things in the world that can open windows for us onto what is new and unknown, that can awaken in us sleeping senses for the contemplation of universes that we should never have known. Distrust is a dynamo, throwing off furious psychic energy, opening obscure portals. Marie is waiting up for Alexandre. She stubs out her cigarette and rolls over in the bed when he comes in. Revolted, she says he smells of Veronica's perfume, its apt and priceless name, Bandit. She tells him she walked through the streets looking for him. This time, she's the one imagining scenes. She pictured finding him and saying, I love you, stop this game, you'll ruin us. These characters exhaust me, and in their thrall, it seems that echoes of such scenes are all I can remember of my own life, of all the kind and thoughtful people I know who get restless or jealous, who wish they were more free or equal, 
who feel the irresistible gravity of a void beneath them, and to whom, at least on some days, though it would be even more taboo to say so now than it surely was in 1973, nothing and no one really matters. It's daytime. He comes in, Marie's sitting on the bed with her back to him. She informs him frostily that Veronica's been calling. Marie's wearing a black silk shirt and black pants, and it's hard to resist the thought that she's dressed herself to rival the phone. It rings, she answers, it's Veronica again. Marie hands the receiver to Alexandre, but then uses a kind of extra earpiece attached to the telephone by a second cord, a French contraption of the era, perhaps. She eavesdrops as they make a date, then asks him why he wants to go. What should he do instead, he asks her. Stay here, watch TV, listen to the radio, wait for a phone call. I'm a poor, mediocre young man. A poor, mediocre girl wants to see me. I like that, and I won't give it up, no matter what happens. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Matt. I, I just am so, so endlessly floored by this book. I really want to model it to everyone urgently needs to get a copy. Thank you, Anna, for putting the link in the chat again. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you so much, Kate. I really have been looking forward to this reading for so long and I'm like already feeling really sad that it's over. Um, it was just such a gift, such a gift. Um, thank you so much also to Anna and Nicole and Maddie for all of your help making Zoom run smoothly tonight. Thank you all so very much for being here. Um, I hope so much to see you at another Poetry Project event soon. Please feel free to hang out for a while. We'll put on some music, um, be together in this way, and have a lovely evening. Thank you again. Good night.